Welcome to A Watershed Moment, the community media program that celebrates the rivers and connected lands forming the natural circulatory system of our region. The health of these watersheds is intricately tied to that of the humans who live here and affect them. So we invite you to come along as we explore the natural landscape, observe the wildlife, and share the beauty minutes away from our homes and daily commutes. This series will introduce you to the organizations and to the passionate volunteers, organizers, recreationists, athletes, and scientists who work tirelessly to sustain and improve these watersheds. Welcome to the program. I'm Charlotte Pierce, your host, joined by Robert Kearns. Robert is the Charles River Watershed Association's Climate Resilience Specialist. Today we're discussing the Association's advocacy efforts to remove dams and restore the natural ecology along the Charles River. Like many rivers across New England and beyond, the Charles carries the physical vestiges of our early industrial development, like dams. Now, Robert, good, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah. Can you speak to why dams were created on the Charles River and why some are no longer necessary today? Yes, thank you, Charlotte. There's a lot of dams on the Charles River, about a dozen on the main stem of the river. And in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there's over 3,000 dams that are currently not in doing anything, not in any use. Um, and a lot of these, you know, are historic mill dams, old factory mm -hmm. dams that powered the Industrial Revolution. Um, we know that the Charles River was sort of the start of the Industrial Revolution before um, going over to, you know, the Merrimack River and the mills there. So there's, there's a lot of history of industrial revolution and mills and dams in mm -hmm. the Commonwealth. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, aren't these, so these dams aren't doing any, anything. Are they holding back like runoff erosion? Do they help with that or no? So yeah, so there's, so there's different classification of dams and to note there are some dams on the Charles River that do do flood control okay. measures and in the watershed, but, and there's also dams, you know, that help store water for water supply. But the ones that us at the Charles River Watershed are focusing on removing are ones that are not having any current use. And they're actually really degrading the water quality and impacting a lot of wildlife. Okay, you know, so fish migrations and things like that, mm -hmm. bird habitat, nesting, things like that. Yeah. So why and, and how does the Charles River Watershed Association advocate for dam removal? What's the What's the process? Do you get some opposition to that, or is like, do people kind of wonder why you're doing it? Yeah, so how we look at it is a lot of the times we have dams that, you know, they're aging and mm -hmm. they're going into disrepair, and communities are looking at either repairing them or looking at opportunities to remove them. So, for example, there was a uh, situation in the town of Natick where mm -hmm. a, a lot of the viewers may be familiar with the South Natick Dam. It's really an iconic place, and Natick, they had a situation where that dam was built in the 30s, and it really doesn't have any current use other than sort of the recreational views of looking at the impoundment and the spillway. Mm -hmm. However, the dam structure, there's a bunch of trees that are on top of the earthen portion of the dam, which are actually a safety hazard if they fall over For sure. and yeah, topple and the like... water goes through. So there's a community conversation going around mm -hmm you know, whether to remove the trees and restore the dam or take out the spillway and let the water go through. So when we look at advocacy, we look at instances when there's opportunities to um, look at dam repair and we say, hey, is there a conversation? Can we have a conversation? Is there an opportunity to remove this dam? And in that case, a concerned resident actually let us know about this. So. As the viewers, you can look at it in your community if there's a specific dam that's going into repair. Ask the question, is this dam doing anything? Mm -hmm. um, and let your local watershed organization know about it. Was that the one where I saw it on the news, there was like a big rainstorm, like huge, like one of these huge rainstorms we have now, yes. you know, with climate change. And, um, you know, it was like, it looked like it was about to break or something. I don't know if that was the one. But yeah. There was one recently that was that happened. Yeah, I don't think that was that, that one. Was, you, you maybe maybe the water uh, the 
the Waltham, uh, Moody Street Dam, okay. that, that, that mm -hmm. had, a, back in 2010, had an instance mm -hmm. that there was concern a dam failure, and back in 2008, there was a big concern about a dam in Taunton, which they eventually removed, mm -hmm. that had a similar problem. Right. Now, I know uh, you, as a climate resilience specialist, uh, you, you actually know a lot about the species, the fish and bird species that inhabit the watershed. Um, can you uh, explain why, uh, like, how do these dams affect the migratory fish? And I guess eels are not a fish, right? Are they fish? They are a fish. They yeah. are yes, a fish? Yeah. Okay. The they're eel, a type but of they're fish, a special, yeah. <laughs> there's a special kind of fish. Yes. <laughs> um, how, the, how the dams affect that and, you know, yeah. what removing them might, how yes. that might enhance the, the um, migration and breeding. Yeah, so, so when I think of dams, a, a great analogy I've heard and, and I like to say is that, you know, think of the river like a circulatory system in your body. Yes. So it's moving water, it's moving blood, it's moving organisms through the system, and these dams are acting like plaque in your artery, and, you know, it's like a heart attack, you know, yeah. on a river. And, and rivers, like the Charles River, don't have an emergency room where you can take them. So <laughs> we, we need to be actually looking at yeah. removing these structures that are really not having any use um, to yeah. help free the flow of the river because when you're um, blocking that, it's backing up water. And that's doing, number one, heating the water up, mm -hmm. which is lowering the dissolved oxygen, which is so important for your fish and aquatic species, mm -hmm. as well as um, you know impacting that um, water quality. Okay. So there's that aspect, and additionally, you know, there's, they're blocking the passage of the migratory fish. So in the Charles River, we have a few species of migratory fish. We have river herring, which uh, migrate from the ocean into the mm -hmm. rivers to spawn. Additionally, um, we have shad, which do that as well. As Is that the alewife? Is that a shad? Yeah, alewife. Is that also called shad? Or? Uh, uh, they're Is different. So... Alewife are like like the tea station in yeah. uh, in mm -hmm. um, Cambridge. That is a um, type of river herring. So there's mm -hmm. alewife and blueback okay. herring. Got it. Both of them are in the Charles River. They're also in the Mystic and a lot of the other water um, rivers in, in in the Commonwealth. Um, so this so they get blocked um, coming upstream when there's uh, a dam. And people may ask, you know, what about fish ladders? Um, yeah, I and, remember the ones on the Mystic, you know, they yeah. used to have the herring, but now that's kind of going through. Yeah, so we there is a fish ladder on one of the dams, which I think mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit more about, which is Watertown Dam, which is the first dam upstream of the harbor before, after the locks. And that, that fish ladder does not pass the shad. It does pass some of the herring, um, but it doesn't pass any shad, the female shad especially. And um, there's also rainbow smelt, which is another fish, and they can't really do fish ladders either. So those are species that have sort of been removed from the food chain upstream. Exactly. By these dams and by the stopping. Yep, and they, and they want to go up there to spawn, and, yeah. and they know, which is kind of amazing, they know which river mm -hmm. to go up and where they want to spawn, and they have this sort of internal mm -hmm. guiding navigation system to, to I define I know, it's the it. coolest thing. Yeah. It's just the coolest. Um, so if the dams were removed, would they just know to go on up the river? Would yes, it? yeah, they, wow. they would know. and You don't have to, like, take one, <laughs> take one and sort of, you know, babysit it up the river. No. <laughs> Plunk it in the water. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Interesting. Wow. The, the other thing about fish ladders is yeah. even the ones want that, that, say, like, the ones that pass the herring, yeah. they congregate the fish in one location, which makes them susceptible to predation. So a lot of the birds or poachers can go in there and they just find them all at once and that's not the best thing. And it doesn't do the water quality benefits of right. reducing um, the temperature because you know you want more dissolved oxygen mm -hmm. as well as um, the impacts for um, you know all the other things um, with respect to the water quality. So a lot of habitat for spawning has been lost and is that, do you have any other observations on that? There was one, the, the Natick Dam um, that you were talking about. It would, removing the dam would reconnect a total of like 25 miles of 
of a river? Yes. Yeah, so the spawning, um, spawning habitat. Yeah, and Natick's yeah. a, a particular interest, because right now the fish can't get all the way up mm -hmm. to that location. Um, but historically, we found records of back in the 1700s where there was a, um, a law in the state legislature that said that allowed the town of Natick to regulate shad and um, alewife okay. um, fishing. So we know that the fish have gotten historically all the way past Natick. It's like a detective yeah. story. You know? like, it's, it's, it's really cool. We know cool. that they were there. <laughs> and, and you know, and I think yeah. some of the communities don't don't have that connection mm -hmm. that some of the downstream communities have with the fish. Sure. Um, yeah. But it, just just given that history really helps you know yeah. push the envelope on the conversation. And it gives you a, a place to start when you're talking about you know the historical justification for mm -hmm. removing them. Um, and how about the uh, any other observations on the water quality? The you know I know. Um, and, and the uses of the river, I, I'm a rower, so like, is this gonna change the river that I row on? You know, like, will I have less water to use or does it have any effect on that? Like yes. kayaking and, yeah. That, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. And um, with respect to like paddling, a lot of these dams like Watertown Dam mm -hmm. are low head dams where you know, you can't see the dam from upstream sometimes, so they're, they're kind of dangerous if you're in a paddle situation and you don't know that it's there. And, you know, you could go over it and, and sort of tumble into this, you know, <laughs> drowning machine. So yeah, they're, they're, we stop at Watertown Square going upstream, yeah. so we're not, we're not really allowed to go any further. Yeah, so yeah. they're kind of dangerous in yeah. that aspect. Mm -hmm. but, um, but they're... A lot of, and, and, and with that situation, they run a river dam, so all the water that comes in is going out, out. of it for, for, with respect to the... So nothing is really held back in a big reservoir. No. Yeah, right. Not, not for those dams. The, the flood control dams, they, they do hold back, so like right. Moody Street would. And how does that, how would removing them improve the, um, like the plant life and the, the botanical environment? You know? Yes, that's a good question. So... Uh, um, removing the dam, you know, there's a lot behind a lot of these impoundments. There's mm -hmm. um, invasive plants. So you got the um, water chestnuts, for example, and mm -hmm. they are really noxious and blocking, you know, the the recreational light. Recreational yep, use recreational too, too for also, the paddlers. Yeah, also the um, oxygenation, right? Or, yep, yep, yeah. uh -huh. and. Um, by removing the dams, you actually can get the flow in, and that actually helps reduce, you know, the infestation of um, right. the the water chestnuts and other invasive species. Right. So that's one thing. Another thing is all of the impoundment area, the mill ponds, so so to say, behind the dam. That, you know, as the water level, the water level would recede a little bit, mm -hmm. and you would plant, or and, and some of the native seed bank would come back and native plants would be back and have a more of an area between the river and say the park land that DCR owns for a buffer um, cool. yeah. for impacts from water Is there quality. any way we can take the poison ivy out from the park? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it's, that a native plant? I believe so, it is. It but shouldn't it's, be. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm deathly allergic to I it. Yeah. Fell into a, I fell off the dock, the, the rowing club the oh, other really? day, and I just got a bad case of it. But once in a while, they have uh, the geese, the goats. I'm sorry, come down and you know um, eat the poison ivy yep. down. It's... Now, uh, you mentioned your specialty at climate resilience. Um, that dams are susceptible to failure with climate change, and how does that kind of work briefly? Can you explain, you know, how that, mm -hmm. you know, they, like the storm we just had? You know, I mean, it might be not normal. It might not, you know, but if we have a lot of them, how does that happen? Yes. So in Massachusetts and New England in the Northeast, we're, we're projected to have stronger storms with climate change, but mm -hmm. specifically more rainfall. So we're going to have impacts of more inland flooding. So we're really concerned about that impacting our, you know, defunct dams that are really going into disrepair. Mm -hmm. um, so like we were talking about earlier, we have concerns of dam breach where the water could go topple over a dam and potentially erode around it and, and have a huge dam failure. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, the high winds like we had the past uh, few days could topple trees, and if the water went through that 
area. It could help erode the earth in parts of some dams, like Watertown Dam, or yeah. it's a major concern for South Natick. So right. um, we're concerned about yeah. impacts of stronger storms on these really aging structures. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like a slow moving, not disaster, but you know, like potential disaster, you mm -hmm. know, because you, you, you take one rainstorm and then, you know, but you add like five rainstorms of a similar magnitude and you've got a problem yes. happening, you know, so. Um, we have a few more m minutes left. I have a few more questions. Um, we're wondering, like, you have, like, how many people are in this watershed? Like, how many, what's the population that inhabits this watershed? Do you have that information? I don't have it on the top of my head, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge population because you got city of Boston, you got right. Cambridge, um, as well as it goes, you know, all the way up to Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know. It, it's like the Boston Marathon. The Charles River goes from Hopkinton to Boston, yeah. but it meanders a lot, a lot of the way. Yeah, your um, director, Emily Norton, mentioned that one time. She said, do you know where it starts? <laughs> I, yes. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. You know, people don't know. I mean, they just drive the roads and they don't necessarily know what's where the watershed it starts mm -hmm. and stops. But so you have maybe a million and a half, Two million people, maybe that are commuters or or inhabitants of this watershed. Um, so there's some potential advocates there. Yes. Yep. And can you kind of detail in the last ten minutes or so what people can do, where they can, you know, volunteer or or advocate for, for uh, the health of the watershed. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're launching a river advocate program this fall, so, mm -hmm. so folks can, you know, check out our website, crwa.org, to get involved, and we'll be having trainings for folks in the watershed to learn about how to be an effective advocate for um, policies surrounding climate resilience. Additionally, like I said previously, it'd be important to, if people see dams in their community or have concerns about them, mm -hmm. or your, your community's going through a process of looking at, you know, your structures to... Uh, make sure that your watershed organization like CRWA is involved and yeah. can help guide and give, you know, advice on, on how to proceed. Right. And I know that some of the boathouses like mine, uh, Community Rowing, um, many, many of the rowers are, are advocates and they are actively involved. They go to mm -hmm. the city council meetings. They go to the, you know, they write articles and, and it's, there's a, a lot of uh, vested interests really in, in maintaining the health of the, of the river yep. there. Yeah. Um, and how is it, I mean, as far as the government, dealing with the government, how does that work, and is that a smooth process, or is there a pretty, pretty good awareness of what needs to be done with the watershed? With respect to dams? Dams, or, or okay. yeah, you know, like when you go to advocate to remove a dam, you know, there's people that might mm -hmm. not want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does the state government, are they kind of aware and involved? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So I would say that specifically for dam removal, Massachusetts is really ahead of the curve and really okay. advocating for dam removal. There's an uh, organization or an agency called the Division of Ecological Restoration. They're a big partner for CRWA and other watershed organizations to help, um, you know, do the technical assistance and finances to remove the dams. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to other state agencies, we're having some pushback, specifically with DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, it's, on yeah. removing Watertown Dam specifically. Okay. So we're, you know, doing some scheming and, and thinking of ways to help put more pressure strategizing. on. Strategizing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> scheming, strategizing. <laughs> Whatever. Um, yeah. And, and you know, we, we want to yeah. you know help advocate for that because that's really the first dam that's got to come out to help get okay. the fish further up to eventually South Natick. They can get pretty far. There's ladders at Watertown Dam, obviously. Yeah. Moody Street Dam has a ladder. It's not the best, I hear, so mm -hmm. you'd eventually want to get that fixed. Yeah. But, um, and then there's a couple more dams, and they can get all the way up pretty much to Route 9, but the dams there, sort of in the um, Newton area, Upper Newton Falls, the okay. Silk Mill Dam, and the Circular Dam uh, don't have ladders. So no fish can get past there, which is unfortunate, but, you know, we're going to advocate sort of starting from the bottom and working Got its it. way up. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
you know, a lot of people at my club are really, you know, working for that. And, um, and so we've talked about this a little bit, but the, you know, people kind of get nostalgic for the historical, you know, the aesthetic, you know, the dams, you know, the water flow, waterfall, mm -hmm. you know, spillway, um, they kind of like that. Is that, will that, will that change the river? Will it make it more, I mean, I guess, would, river's not boring to me, but <laughs> some people yes. like to go to a dam and see water flowing down. <laughs> no, and that's, yeah. and that's really true. I mean, I think the, the number one thing that comes into my head is South Natick Dam. It's really iconic yeah. place. People have their wedding photos there. It's mm -hmm. really sentimental value mm -hmm. for people. And, you know, I feel for people where, where they have this sort of attachment to the structure. Um, so, it, it, you know, they're going through a whole community process surrounding that. But one of the things that I like to say with respect to that dam is that, um, in all dams, is that a lot of the time they're built on natural changes in elevation. Right. So there's likely going to be some riffles there, mm -hmm. some rocks. Um, and also when they remove the dams, they can put in some boulders to really have a, a structure Sweet. in places where the water flows. You still have that sound of, of, the, of the rushing water, see riffles and see moving water. So mm -hmm. that's something that can be taken into consideration when these projects are done. Got it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's uh, something to consider. I know, I mean, no, I know that every time there's a change, you know, people flip out a little bit, or some people do, you know, they, they kind of are afraid to, mm -hmm. to remove things. But do you feel like, do you feel like this process is achievable? And like, what, what would, what's the time frame for sort of like every few years one? Or do you have a sense of, of how successful it's going to be in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years? Mm -hmm. I would say that it's it's a slow process. Yeah. You know, we have, like I said, about a little bit more than a dozen dams on the main stem of the river. So the work is going to continue. It's um, there's a lot of like fact finding that has to go into removing a dam. Got to yeah. look at the sediments. You got to look at you mm -hmm. know historic structures and that sort of thing. So in permitting, so it's going to take a few years, probably five or ten. Um, but it's really starting at the advocacy level um, and, and getting that decision to say, okay, we're going to take out this dam. That's the, really the hard and the first step. Yeah. Um, and once you get that, it, it'll take some time, but you can work with it and, and the state's really helping out. Are there that. sometimes, uh, is, does there have to be a referendum or, or some kind of vote in a town to do that? Yeah, so it depends, it depends on, the, on the structure. So some of the dams are privately owned and, and that, those dams the dam owner has the ultimate decision. Right. In the case of South Natick, that's the town. So they have set up a committee that's going to, to vote and make a recommendation to the select board right. who have the ultimate decision. Um, and they're ha taking input right now. Mm -hmm. So if people are listening in Natick, uh, they can contact right. the committee. Um, for a lot of the dams, especially like Watertown, it's owned by the state DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of more opaque where they're a public agency, but they, um, you know, they have they have to serve the public. But you know, we have to still advocate to them to remove the structure. So for sure, it's it's yeah. interesting. I just had a couple more questions. One about the changes. If you remove the dam, how does that change the flow, and does it affect the the you know sediments and what might be in those sediments? I imagine over decades and centuries, <laughs> maybe there's been some stuff that's just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Will that affect the water quality? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Okay. And um, as a part of a process of removing a dam, they have the, the applicant, the dam owner, will do studies to, to test the sediment behind the dam. So they'll see if there's any contamination mm -hmm. from oil or any you know, industrial pollution like PCBs. And um, that's something that they have to look into. Yeah. Um, and specifically, they'll... Um, you know, say they find oil or other contamination in, in behind the dam, they'll have to develop a sediment management plan to help, you know, make sure that that sediment doesn't get released downstream and impact, you know, the water quality um, in the river. Right. And sometimes they have to remove sediment and, and, and probably dispose of it if it's, if it's um, 
you know, yeah. of a concern. But um, the way I see it is, it's better to remove that sediment in a proper manner than have a situation where there's a dam failure and that just gets yeah, blown out. Yeah, it just gets out. flushed out. Yeah, because we have that with you know we we have to stop rowing sometimes because of sewage overflow is yes, coming yeah. in and, and that we have red flags and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that could be another factor. One, yeah. One other thing I'd like to mention about sure. sediments is um, th there is a benefit to having you know proper sediments and proper river bottom mm -hmm. for fish species okay. specifically. So the dams are really blocking the sediment. So when there's clean sediment, you know, you want that to naturally flow downstream to help, mm -hmm. you know, replenish our beaches and our coastline. So they're really blocking the sediments too, not only the fish, but, but that stuff. So, so it's dropping out yes. before it goes to where it should be going. Yes. Yeah. So by removing the dam, you'll allow that yeah. natural sediment to replenish downstream. Yeah. And eventually get to the ocean. So that's. Is, is there any, like I know I, I have to confess that I've gotten out of my boat and a, my phone has fallen into the river. <laughs> so I feel really bad about that, but I know I'm not the only one. Yes. Yep. Is there a lot of stuff down there, like around the that's fallen off of boats and and docks and things like that, that's detrimental, or is that just sitting in the sediment and not doing anything? Yeah, I would say... Will they dredge of, it? You know, would they dredge it? Or Yeah, I would say that, that'd probably be site-specific, you know. Yeah, okay. And that's part of the sediment management plan, whether okay. they would, you know, dredge some parts or, right. or what, what have you. But there's definitely, you know, CRWA understands that there is contaminated sediments in parts of the river that we're yeah. looking at. Um, when we talk about I-90 project, we're really concerned about that because they want to put the road in the river and they want to put a... Um, you know, yeah. the bike path and the pedestrian path in the river. And that we're really concerned about them disturbing those PCBs right. in that area right downtown and yeah, you know, by BU. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't really understand that thing completely, but I'd like to do a, another uh, yes. episode on that and just talk about that whole project because it affects a lot of people, commuters, you know, residents, fish, wildlife, it, river, everything. Rowers, boaters, Rowers, yeah. yeah. And we, I mean, I, yeah, I need to understand it better. Yes. Um, and the other thing we were going to ask you is about the cost and who bears that cost and how does that play out in the dam removal? Yes, and that's a great question. And, mm -hmm. you know, these old structures, these mill dams, you know, over 100 years old, a lot of them, or, you know, you know that, that's a big, you know, feat to help repair 3,000 of those that aren't doing anything in the right. state. Right, yeah. It's so just, if they need repair, they need yeah. repair, and, or you can take them out, and that's yep. a cost. Yeah. So the, the cost of repairing it is a lot of times more expensive than removing it, and, it's, and that's a cost that you have to keep doing every yeah. 10 years, every 20 years um, on a structure that's not providing flood control, not um, providing any um, drinking water storage. So it's really a bad investment to, to sink money in to repair something mm -hmm. that's not going to have any benefit for the public or for the for the private dam owner. So um, there's a lot of funds to actually from the state to remove the dam. So it's really a win-win for the dam owner and for the general public to not have to pay to fix these aging structures that aren't doing anything. That's a very important thing. And we can use that money to enhance the, the environment or, yes. you know, kids educational programs or something. Yes. But yeah, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in today and thank the many others on our team that helped plan this show. Our goal with this program is to help amplify this information and all of the amazing work being done for these watersheds. You can learn how you can offer direct support to the Charles River Watershed Association by visiting crwa.org and watch the other episodes in this series at acmi.tv or on the ACMI public channel. And we're always looking for volunteers here on A Watershed Moment. To get involved with this show, just email info at acmi.tv. I'm Charlotte Pierce, and this has been A Watershed Moment.